and right. go ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. I really appreciate you having me here. Um, appreciate everyone's attention. Um, I'm excited to speak with you all today. I'm gonna share my screen. Psilocybin therapy for depression and anxiety in Parkinson's disease. And that's what we're gonna be talking good. about today. All right, great. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, so, so like Rick said, I, I'm a doctor, I'm a, a physician trained in, in psychiatry and I work at UCSF and at the San Francisco VA. Um, and I'm part of a research group led by Dr. Josh Woolley. Uh, and our group is doing a series of projects to try to understand how we may be able to use psychedelic drugs um, to treat uh, multiple neuropsychiatric illnesses and incorporate them into mainstream healthcare. And this particular project is really uh, is really exciting for me. I feel so lucky to be able to work on it um, because I spend my time uh, as a doctor in the, a movement disorders clinic at the San Francisco VA. And so I work with folks with PD and other movement disorders uh, clinically as part of this really awesome multidisciplinary team we have at San Francisco VA. Um, and I've learned just a tremendous amount through that work um, about what it means to live with PD from, from the other providers in the clinic, from patients, from care partners as well. And that's been a wonderful experience and has really motivated me to, to work on this project. So wonderful opportunity to, to talk to you about it today. Um, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. I think the first few minutes of this, I'm just going to go over some information about kind of the challenge of treating depression and anxiety in PD, because, you know, that's really what's kind of at the core of our motivation for this study. So this, this might be a familiar analogy to folks in this group. A, a lot of people will describe PD as as like an iceberg, right? That um, there are these there are these visible motor symptoms that many people think of immediately when they when they think of PD. There's the tremors, the slowed movements, difficulty walking. Um, but then there's a huge chunk that's under the water that is not as visible, and people often don't know about until they're living with the illness. Um, and those include loss of smell and taste, sleep problems, constipation and other GI issues, difficulty concentrating and other cognitive challenges, hallucinations and depression and anxiety. It, and of course that's, that's far from an exhaustive list. Those are just some of the other features of the illness that, that many folks are experiencing. And um, today we're gonna focus on depression and anxiety specifically, because I think the, these are particularly important and, and really understudied aspects of the illness. So it's, it's only really pretty recently in the past decade, decade and a half, um, and really thanks to advocacy by, by patients and care partners and, and new research in this area that we uh, in medicine have kind of caught up and started to understand how important depression and anxiety really are um, for folks living with PD. Uh, they are remarkably common. We think now that it's really a majority of patients who are living with depression or anxiety, um, many with both, they often um, run together. It's, these are really impactful symptoms more so than, than we thought a couple of decades ago. Um, there's recent research to suggest that depression and anxiety are actually much stronger predictors of quality of life and overall well-being than even the motor symptoms uh, of the disorder. We know for sure that depression and anxiety are under-recognized in PD because we haven't done a great job even in this kind of centers of excellence where we know we have specialty care available for people. Um, we haven't done a great job consistently screening for 
depressive and anxious symptoms, really making sure to identify these symptoms proactively. Um, and so that's a place where we're, we're really trying to push and incorporate that into regular PD care, because we know that we're probably just missing a lot, a lot of cases. And then finally, depression and anxiety are certainly undertreated. Even when folks are diagnosed with depression or anxiety, many of them are not receiving any kind of treatment. Um, and when we are able to treat, we, you know, we don't have the kind of buffet of treatment options we would ideally like to have. We're fairly limited in terms of our evidence-based treatments. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about what those are, but you know, that has a lot to do with, with why we are doing this study. There was a, a, a common myth, I think maybe still, maybe still this is a myth that, that you know, depression and anxiety are, are really purely reactions to disability in PD. That the reason people might feel this way is because as the disease progresses and folks are experiencing a decline in function, the reaction is to feel depressed or anxious. It's not that, of course, there, there isn't truth to that. And I think there certainly, there certainly is. Um, but we know now that that is certainly not the whole story. Um, so in this figure, we're looking at kind of the schematic of, of PD progression over time. This uh, purple shaded region is, is representing the decline in, in dopaminergic function over time. And we know that, you know, the motor symptoms become really a feature of the illness when about 50 or 60% of those dopaminergic neurons are, are already lost. And so there's quite the, a significant prodromal stage here. And you know, interestingly, that's often where we see depression and anxiety emerge. Um, by the time folks get to the point of diagnosis, about a recent study saw that about you know 30 percent of people already had depression at that point, um, and so it seems that you know depression and anxiety are part of this sort of package of non-motor symptoms that can begin very insidiously in this early prodromal pre-diagnosis phase, years before there's any noticeable motor issues, um, and we also know that. For those who, who do have depression, anxiety, and PD, the motor and the cognitive symptoms seem to progress more aggressively over time. We don't really understand yet why that is. It's a, an ongoing area of study, but you know, it could be that having depression, anxiety, are making it harder to optimize your health, harder to engage in um, healthy behaviors. It could also be, though, that the underlying mechanisms, the, the pathophysiology of depression and anxiety is actually contributing to disease progression. So, you know, if we think that, you know, depression and anxiety are not just reactions um, to disability, what, what does cause them? What could be underlying the changes that we see? Um, and a, a short answer, I think, would be that we, we don't know. Uh, we're not sure yet. But a longer answer is there, there are a few different hypotheses. And I'll just kind of briefly go over them. Um, it's, this is not an exhaustive list, but see, there's sort of some of the leading ideas. One is this idea of imbalanced monoamines. So those are our dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. And we know that because of the neurodegenerative processes in the disorder, that those monoamines are certainly out of balance and that that does affect mood, both in Parkinson's and in the setting of other illnesses. Another idea is this uh, concept of decreased trophic support. Uh, neurotrophins are these proteins, these growth factors that are really important in supporting the survival of our neurons and helping to sort of spur growth and repair of neurons. A really important part of our brain's plasticity, which is you know, this really important tool that we have that allows us to adapt to environmental changes, to learn, to repair. Um, and so it's possible that reduced levels of these supportive proteins have negative effects on 
the function of neurons, uh, and that that is part of what has gone awry in terms of the regulation of mood. Another idea is that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis, uh, plays a role. The HPA axis is this really important hub, uh, regulates our response to stress and a lot of other processes in our body. Uh, and in its dysregulation, we know can lead to overexposure to, to glucocorticoids, to cortisol, which can be pretty rough on certain areas of the brain and may also disrupt our ability to maintain mood. Those kinds of stressors uh, are also associated with a pro-inflammatory response in the brain and in the periphery out in the rest of the body. Um, and so it could be that a kind of neuroinflammatory response in the brain is another kind of another way that this circuitry um, that regulates our mood gets out of whack. And then finally, um, there's you know, the role of mitochondria and, and oxidative stress. So mitochondria are these little organelles in our cell that are really key uh, in energy production. And uh, when they get damaged, the neuron can have a hard time keeping up with its ability to communicate and, and remain resilient. So it's possible that that is another kind of mechanism of damage that then leads to kind of downstream mood dysfunction if that's happening in mood-related circuitry. Uh, and I think it's, it's really important to remember, of course, that th these are not mutually exclusive mechanisms. It, it may be that, that each of these you know, plays a role in mood changes. It may be that some are more important than others for certain individuals. Uh, and there can also be other processes that we aren't aware of yet that are playing a role. So another thing that I think is really important to be mindful of is that, you know, in addition to the ways that the illness itself can lead to mood changes, we have to, we have to remember that also our treatments for some of the symptoms of Parkinson's can worsen mood. Uh, this is a, a graphic showing, you know, the uh, dopamine levels, both the natural dopamine level, and then the blue line is showing a medicated uh, dopamine level in the early, middle, and advanced stages of the illness. And I mean, as I'm sure many folks here are familiar with, the, you know, when, when folks start on dopamine replacement on their levodopa, they're dosing multiple times a day. Um, these medications are, are relatively short acting. And so, so you're getting these fluctuations, right, in this medicated dopamine level. And that can have different effects on mood in different folks. For some, they find they get a mood boost. But for others, it seems to make it harder to maintain mood stability. And as we get towards that middle and advanced stage where people are starting to experience more off periods um, shown in the pink, the pink shading, uh, shaded areas, uh, and of course, levodopa-induced levodopa dyskinesias shown in the purple areas, then anxiety in particular can be a big part of these fluctuations. Um, and so this is again, just another kind of way that the thing we have to think about when we're considering, um, you know, what factors into depression and anxiety over the course of the illness. And it's this, it's this combination of, um, you know, multiple degenerative processes uh, that are impacting mood, and then the treatments that we're layering on top of them that can impact mood and our you know, under recognition of depression and anxiety that has led to you know, what some researchers call this sort of perfect storm situation where we're really not serving patients well enough in this, in this really complex area. Uh, and I think the, the good news um, you know, from our perspective is that better understanding of these symptoms and, and what might be causing them is, has really shifted the way we think about PD. I think it's really increased our appreciation for what a complex disorder this is far beyond um, simply a motor disorder is a very complex neurologic and psychiatric illness. Um, and, and it's 
really good to know that you know, depression and anxiety now have been identified as real priority areas of study um, if we want to make sure that we're improving real world function for people with PD. So we do have our work cut out for us. Um, we, you know, despite the impact where we are lagging in terms of treatment options that are effective for patients, I'm gonna briefly review kind of, you know, our approach currently, uh, and then we'll talk about this, this new direction of research. I, I think it's, it's really important to always highlight, you know, the strategies that patients are using uh, that don't involve medications, um, the kind of non-pharmacologic approaches. And, you know, those include work with organizations that I'm sure people here are familiar with, uh, Dance for PD, which is an amazing organization started by a dance company in New York um, that, you know, was started similar to, to Rocksteady with a focus on exercise as a, a way of improving motor symptoms. But it turns out it also can be really supportive of, of people's moods. And there and there's some new studies um, that are showing a, a good effect and, and that's really exciting. Also, you know, implementing a mindfulness practice. I have several patients who've done this and, and feel it's been really beneficial for their mood. And I think that's another place where we're gonna see more study in the coming years and, and hopefully some really promising results. And then, you know, finally, more, more formal psychotherapy. Uh, there's some positive findings and studies of, of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, which is a kind of structured therapy that's, that's really about trying to shift the cognitions uh, and emotions that tend to, to support depression and anxiety and try to kind of break those down. Uh, and build the skills to really change thought patterns. And, and it seems to have really good effects in PD and help a lot of people. And so that's something you know, we're trying to increase patient access to. And then of course, um, there's approaches that do involve medication. Um, it doesn't always mean adding a medication. I always you know, say when, when we're talking about this in clinic, like the first thing we have to do is really kind of stand back and look at what medications folks are already using um, for motor symptom control and make sure that we have optimized those. So are we doing all we can to try to minimize fluctuations? Are we making sure that people aren't over-medicated to a point where they're having negative mood effects? So, so that's the first thing is just to kind of deal with what's already on the table because that may go a long way. And then, after that, um, you know, melatonin is, is a, a really low risk uh, medication and naturally occurring hormone in our bodies that, that many people are already taking, but, but if they're not, often suggest that people try it because you know, we do think that it, it may have neuroprotective um, properties and, and can help to kind of address these circadian rhythm related sleep problems, which we know also can really influence mood. It's hard to maintain your mood with poor sleep. Um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are kind of the, the most common class of, of antidepressants um, that people are probably familiar with. That's like SSRIs, SNRIs. Um, and you know there is, there is evidence that these can help a, a percentage of people um, with PD. Folks tend to have a, a partial response um, but they do, yeah, they are helpful for many people. Often we use sertraline, um, escitalopram. Those are sort of, sort of the most common ones we, we reach for. Um, but there are quite a few people who, who don't get a benefit from those sort of first line depression and anxiety, uh, medications. And then, you know, we, we can turn to other antidepressants that have different mechanisms than those serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like mirtazapine, which can also help with sleep, bupropion, which has some dopaminergic activity, so it can often, often help to support mood that way. Um, and then another thing that, that folks sometimes do, um, but we don't have great evidence for, is using dopamine agonists, um, which of course are, are part of kind of our our collection of meds that we're using for, for motor symptom control. 
but have also been shown to you know, be able to support mood. So this is from Pexil, Rapinarol, that class of medications. The, the tricky thing about those, of course, is as we all know, they, the dopamine agonists can have some serious side effects and can precipitate impulse control disorders that can be really hard to treat and pretty disruptive for folks. So those are not, not a great choice if we, if we don't have to, to use them. And I, I think, you know, kind of standing back and, and looking at these, the, the takeaway is that, you know, we do have, we do have some options, um, quite a few options that we can work through with patients to try to find a fit for treating depression and anxiety. But sometimes we get to the end of this list and we still find that, you know, we're, we haven't been able to get on top of these symptoms. We haven't been able to help people enough. Um, we have this, you know, treatment resistant depression, anxiety, and, and we really need to be able to do more to offer people more treatment options. And so that brings us to, to the, the study at hand. The, the question that, that we really wanna answer is to figure out whether psilocybin therapy can help to treat depression and anxiety uh, in PD. Uh, I don't know if folks here have read this book. Uh, it, it's, it's a very popular book that was on bestseller lists a few years ago, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. Um, I think it's, it's one of the kind of recent works that has really put psychedelics back on the map um, in sort of the, uh, the mainstream. It generated a lot of excitement about the potential of psychedelics to enhance well-being. Um, Michael Pollan talks in this book about his personal kind of journey uh, to try to do that. Uh, it, it's, it's a really interesting book. If you haven't read it, I do, I'd recommend it. Um, and, you know, it, so this is, I think it's been really influential in, in the kind of pop culture. Um, but, you know, in recent years, we've also seen that it, within medicine, uh, there's been a huge amount of excitement about psychedelics as actual medical treatments for a, a range of, of disorders come, going from you know, depression and anxiety to cognitive impairment to uh, smoking cessation, um, alcohol use disorder, like quite, quite a list. Um, and this, you know, this graphic shows kind of the, the rise and the number of different different uh, clinical trials going on uh, involving psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, these different psychedelic substances. And I, I know that this, you know, this graphic was created, I think in early 2021. I think now this bar for 2021 would be way off of this slide. There's just been kind of an explosion in this area of research. Um, if you do a search on, on clinicaltrials.gov can get a sense for what people are, are working on. So, you know, what I think before we dive into the, the more nitty gritty of the study, it's good to, you know, we hear a lot about psychedelics. It's good to just quickly go over, you know, what, what do we, what do we mean when we talk about uh, psychedelics? I've highlighted psilocybin, you know, that's the one that, that we're focusing on today, but just for a little bit of background, this graphic is showing us um, in, in green are the substances that are purely made uh, synthetically in, in the lab. And then the ones that are sort of in this yellow color uh, are, are naturally occurring. So they can be, can be extracted directly from uh, plants and, and fungi. Um, so LSD, uh, also known as acid, MDMA, also known as ecstasy, um, those are, those are laboratory produced ketamine as well. Um, ketamine is a drug that has been used since, since the sixties, uh, for anesthesia and is now also being repurposed, um, to treat depression. Psilocybin is a substance that can be extracted from, uh, I believe it's over 200 species of, of mushrooms that contain it, uh, ibogaine, mescaline, DMT, those are all uh, different uh, compounds with different pharmacologic properties, but similarly found in nature, found in plants. DMT is actually uh, produced by some animals as well. And ayahuasca is a, 
a traditional tea that's used in the Amazon basin uh, for you know, ritual and ceremonial practices that, that contains DMT, dimethyltryptyline, as its kind of active uh, psychedelic ingredient. And the, these are, even though we call these all psychedelics, you know, they, this really encompasses kind of a broad range of drugs. These drugs have pretty different mechanisms and effects, um, and it's important to study each of them separately. And so, you know, we'll, we'll just focus on, on psilocybin, um, but I'm happy to discuss other substances um, if we have time at the end. So this idea of, of using psilocybin uh, to support health is, is absolutely not a new idea at all. Uh, on the left here uh, is a, a mushroom statue that was found in you know, what is now Guatemala. Uh, many of these have been found in different parts of the world. The human use of, of psilocybin in really uh, in ceremonial practices um, in healing practices, it dates back thousands of years um, and, and is continued uh, by, you know, within several indigenous groups, um, largely in Mexico today. Uh, and then on, on the right here is a, is a drug called indocybin. This is a synthetic psilocybin that was marketed by a, a Swiss drug company in the mid 20th century when uh, psychedelics kind of had their initial boom. Um, so, so in a way there's, there's nothing new here. Um, yeah, and we'll just go over what, so what is psilocybin? This, this is what psilocybin looks like. It's actually a, it's a prodrug, meaning that it, you know, it, the substance that we ingest has to be processed in our bodies in order to become it, its active form. So when we ingest psilocybin, uh, it's quickly converted to psilocin, that's its active form, um, after, soon after we swallow it. And uh, I, I think that, you know, the, I don't put up this slide to, um, to kind of drag anyone back to, to high school chemistry, but, but I think it's, it's nice to look at it because when we look at the, the structure of psilocin, the, the active form of the drug, um, and we look at it next to serotonin, we can see that they have a lot of structural similarity. Um, it, they, they really bear close resemblance and, and you know, not surprisingly, psilocin binds to several types of serotonin receptors in our bodies. Um, and we know that that's, that's one of the ways that it's probably inducing its effects. Although I think it, I don't want to oversimplify it. it. It's probably that in addition to action through serotonin receptors, it induces a, a complex cascade reaction um, and has you know, far reaching effects and in involving other neurotransmitters. But, but it's interesting to see how, how much it looks like serotonin. Um, the onset of action of psilocybin, you take it, it's, it's metabolized to the psilocin and it, you start to feel the effects usually within about half an hour. And then the peak subjective effects happen about 90 minutes to, to two hours after that. And, and people usually are, feel you know, back to normal, so to speak, uh, after about five to six hours, it's when the effects, uh, the acute effects wear off. So what, what do people experience when they, when they take psilocybin? Um, this, this is a kind of a cool graphic that is, um, it's from a series of surveys of people who were in research studies, who were, they were surveyed right after they had a psilocybin experience. So kind of about like six or eight hours right after the effects had worn off and they were asked to rate their experience on all these different dimensions. So as we go out in the circle, those are, those are higher ratings, uh, more intensity. And I think the, the takeaways from, from this figure are, well, first that we can see that a lot of what people experience are these perceptual changes. Um, and these can be really profound for people. Um, they can be kind of uh, increasing in, they can, there can be vivid imagery, um, intense colors, and patterns. 
Um, there can be synesthesia. So when the senses kind of cross over, um, like the idea of tasting the color blue, that's something that people can describe. Um, people can also experience what, what's labeled here as changed meaning of percept so that they, they might look at an object that, that generally seems ordinary to them, doesn't have any particular meaning, but feel as though it has a new meaning or a new purpose in their life. Another thing we see here is that psilocybin tends to induce these feelings of a, a blissful state or an experience of unity or oneness. This is something people very commonly report that they felt that they were uh, had a sense of being part of a larger whole in the way in a way that was sort of new or, or different for them. And, and it's also important to see here that you know there can be there can be changes that people find challenging or distressing, like uh, a sense of disembodiment. Um, a patient said to me that they felt at one point that their body might be melting. Um, there can be a sense of being outside of the body and impaired control and cognition during, that, during the acute phase of the drug. So feeling these, these cognitive changes that, that for some people can be quite anxiety provoking. I think you know whenever we are are talking about drugs, it's 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 really important to of course talk about the the risk of harm of any drug. Um, I, I like this graphic because it's showing us both the on the y-axis we're looking at the dependence potential, so abuse potential, and on the x-axis the ratio of the active dose, the amount that people are typically using to to get the effect they want. Um, the ratio of that active dose to the lethal dose of the drug. And it's kind of nice to see all these different uh, compounds in relation to one another. I, I think it surprises a lot of people. I, I'm, I was surprised to learn that psilocybin is here, you know, on the, the bottom left, um, ranking quite low on, on both of these measures. Um, you know, the toxicity of psilocybin is is quite low. I, I, I haven't, I can't say I've done this math myself, but another researcher told me you'd have to eat a, about half your body weight in mushrooms probably to, to reach a, a toxic level of psilocybin, which I, I think might be impossible. Um, uh, and then in terms of dependence there, you know, there's interesting studies, um, both epidemiological studies surveying people who use psilocybin as well as animal studies that suggest that psilocybin has this low potential for dependence. And, and what we mean by that is, you know, when we ask people who use these drugs out in the community, how they use them and how frequently they use them and how much they want to use them if they crave them, we find that people don't seem to seek the drug again and again, don't seem to crave the drug. Um, it's, pretty standard for people to use a drug and then maybe quite a lot of time will pass and then they would, they would use it again. Um, and, and also that sort of, that sort of dovetails with the, the animal studies. These are mostly, you know, studies in, in rodents where um, they're given access to the drug and we see, you know, how much do they keep coming back for more? How much do they keep trying to seek out more of this drug? And we find that they really, don't seem to even after experiencing the effect, they don't really come back to it. So I think this is, this is an important thing to keep in mind just whenever we're evaluating kind of our, our personal sense of risk. And, and you know, it's important to know this about, about any drug we're, we're considering using in a study or not. Um, and of course, it's important to recognize that this, this graphic, this is not to say that psilocybin doesn't have negative effects. The, the most common acute negative effects that people experience are nausea um, and transiently elevated blood pressure and heart rate. Psilocybin is a little bit stimulating. And so people will often get an increase in their heart rate and, um, and their blood pressure for a few hours after taking the drug. And people can also have a headache um, after using it that usually lasts for um, about a half a day or a day. Another safety issue that, that comes up a lot and I think is, 
really important is this, this idea of, of the bad trip, you know, which I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of lore about the bad trip and, and some, some tales from the sixties that, that can be pretty frightening. Um, and I think it's an issue we have to take really seriously. You know, the idea of a bad trip where um, you have a psychedelic experience that is very distressing or that causes you to behave erratically. And, and that experience can really stay with you and be very powerful. There, there are certainly stories people can tell about these bad trips that, are, that were pretty upsetting. Um, and there was an interesting study a few years ago, uh, a survey of about 2,000 people who use psilocybin out in the community. So just you know, in unsupervised settings, not related to medical care or any studies. And, and you know, they were trying to figure out kind of what people's challenging experiences were like. So they asked people specifically about these bad trips and what happened during these kind of their worst experience on psilocybin ever. And they found that, you know, about 10% of those people said that they had put themselves uh, or someone else at risk of physical harm um, during that bad trip. And, and about 10% also record, reported that they experienced unwanted psychological effects after that lasted after the experience. So these are, these are, you know, really serious considerations. And I think, you know, a critical question for, for our group as researchers is, you know, so how, how do we safely harness this drug for treatment to understand its potential? Um, because there's a lot of enthusiasm about what it might be able to do, but we also certainly don't want to induce um, these bad experiences. So people have put quite a bit of of thought into this, that question over the past about 15 years during this sort of boom of, of psychedelic research. And, and really every modern psilocybin study, every study that's been done in the past 15 years has had this very specific focus on optimizing what we call set and setting. Set refers to, to mindset, so kind of the psychological uh, space that someone's in when they are preparing for uh, in the middle of or or, af or immediately after the a psychedelic experience. Um, the idea that that is a very important sort of container um, that, that needs to be kind of shaped and monitored. Uh, and then the setting, which is really the, the physical setting, the, the place where the, the psychedelic experience occurs. And so there's a focus on really, um, you know, administering psilocybin in, in a controlled environment with supervision and with the help of experts who can offer guidance to patients throughout the experience um, to avoid to, the, to avoid that outcome of, of having a bad trip like we talked about. And so the, the structure that, that really all of these studies follow is, uh, is pretty similar. It usually involves three phases. The, the first one is a preparation phase where a patient sits down with someone who, usually a psychotherapist and someone who has special training in psychedelic work. And this usually happens over a few sessions, over a total of about six or eight hours. These are meetings where there's just talking. There's talking about you know, the person's background, what brings them to this study, what their goals are, what kind of symptoms they're hoping to treat um, with the psilocybin, and also kind of setting expectations about what might happen during the drug experience. Um, in our lab, we usually walk people through sort of a, a simulated dosing session, kind of going through the motions of, of what it might be like on the day that they take the psilocybin. And then after that preparation phase, um, that we, we really don't end that preparation phase until the patient feels comfortable moving on to the next step. Then uh, that's when we do the, the psilocybin session itself. Um, and the psilocybin session is really, it's an all day affair. Um, people come in early, usually about 8 a.m. To our, to our research unit at UCSF. And after you know, meeting with their their facilitator, their, their therapist that they've kind of built this rapport with. Um, they take a, a psilocybin capsule 
we don't use any mushrooms in studies. All, all the psilocybin we use is it's synthesized in, in the lab. So it looks like kind of any other pill. Um, take that pill and then each of our patients is given a set of eye shades and, and headphones. We play relaxing music and, and people lie down on, on a bed or a couch. And, and, and like most of these research units, ours included, they're set up to be, you know, it's not like being in, in sort of a hospital environment. Um, we try not to have any beeping alarms or anything like that or any disruption. It's sort of a quiet space that looks more like a living room. Um, but we, of course, have monitoring equipment um, and medications nearby in case we, we need them. And, and we really let the, the patient guide the experience. The, the facilitator, the therapist is there the whole time as the drug takes effect through its peak. And then as it resolves, so that can, like we said, it can be about four to six hours of the acute effects of the drug. Um, and the, the participants never alone during that time. They're kind of monitored and, and supported during that time. And the, and the facilitators can offer support and reassurance if if the participant does feel frightened or, or anxious about what they're experiencing can sort of be there to talk it through. Um, and that's an, another element that's been shown to be really important in sort of preventing this, this bad trip, the negative experience is having an expert there um, as a support. And then after that drug dosing day, in, in the days after and in the weeks after, there's another series of visits that we call integrations. And so these are, again, meetings where there's no drug, there's, they're just talking. Meeting again, kind of like in the beginning in the preparation sessions, meeting again with the psychotherapist and talking through what happened during that drug experience, what it was like, what was positive about it, what was challenging about it, and, and how a participant is, is making sense of it, kind of figuring out, you know, what does it all mean for my life? How am I feeling now? Um, how has my perspective shifted or not shifted? Um, so I think that's another, it's a really important element uh, of these study designs is that after people take the drug, they don't just go home. You know, they, there's a really kind of intensive process to, to make sure that people can kind of put together what that drug experience means for them. Um, since for many people, it can be pretty intense and profound. So th there's been you know, a lot of exciting early results from, from the studies that have been done so far. And I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go over many studies. I just wanted to highlight this one. Um, this is a really nice study that they did at, at Johns Hopkins and Roland Griffiths' group. Um, these, this is a study of 51 people who had terminal cancer diagnoses and significant depression and or anxiety. And they, they each got uh, a low dose and a high dose of psilocybin using the, the method that, that we just looked at, that I just talked about. And we, we see some really significant changes. So this is, this is showing the, the change in, in depression scores on, on the y-axis. We have the score and, and we can see that um, these patients started pretty, they started with pretty high scores at, at baseline. And then after the, the high dose of psilocybin, there was this really significant decrease in those depressive symptoms. And what's interesting about this is that this is a change that happened very rapidly. This is a change that happened within days of having this single high dose of the psilocybin. We see a really similar pattern with people's ratings of their anxiety. Starting pretty high at baseline, the single high dose of psilocybin in that, the frame of that, that, that supported session we talked about, and there's this dramatic reduction in the severity of their symptoms. So I think the, the, the speed of this response and how large it is, is, is something that really jumps out at us um, because most of our treatments for depression and anxiety work very gradually over the course of, of many weeks. Um, we think that they induce sort of a, 
most drugs we have for depression and anxiety induce sort of a slow neuro adaptation to change mood. Whereas here we see a rapid change. We also see a really big effect, a bigger effect than we often see with many of our current treatments for depression and anxiety. And, and I think the third thing here that, that's really interesting is if you see the last time point that the researchers looked at was at six months. So six months after that high dose of psilocybin and this decrease in depression and anxiety, it was sustained all the way out to that point, which is pretty exciting because we don't have too many treatments, you know, in psychiatry or, or in any area of medicine where we can kind of give a single dose and see an effect that, that lasts a long time. Um, so that, that was a really exciting thing to see. Another element of this study that I thought was nice is that they asked people to kind of rank this experience of, of the psilocybin session, to rank it in terms of how, how meaningful it was in their life relative to other meaningful experiences. And about three quarters of the participants in this study rated this as one of the top five most meaningful experiences of their life, which I found pretty striking. Um, and over 90% of these people said that the, the experience um, increased their sense of, of well-being and, and life satisfaction. So pretty impactful, um, pretty exciting work. And you know, I, I, like I said, I won't go over you know, other studies right now, but just to summarize kind of where things stand in the literature at this point, um, you know, so far in this, these studies that have been done, we see that psilocybin has a strong safety and tolerability profile, uh, meaning that we haven't had any cases of you know, using psilocybin in the context of a study in a controlled environment. Um, we haven't had any cases where people needed medical intervention um, because of a negative outcome. Uh, there have been no serious adverse events in, in any of these trials so far. The, the early findings in terms of clinical effects, in terms of, of improvement in depression and anxiety are, are promising, but I think it's, it's important to remember that most of these studies that have been done in, in pretty small samples, it's gonna, we need to do significantly more research to understand more about who responds to psilocybin and, and when and who it might be a good treatment for. And then, you know, this is really key. So far, uh, psilocybin for depression and anxiety, it's only been looked at in a few clinical populations. And, and what's really relevant to, for this study is that um, in all these previous clinical trials that have been conducted, any patient with any kind of neurodegenerative disorder has been excluded. So that, that's not a population um, that has yeah, that has been you know, allowed in any of the trials so far. So we really don't know yet um, about the effects of psilocybin for folks with movement disorders and PD specifically. And that, you know, is really, that kind of brings us to, well, where, where do we begin to, to address that gap? Where do we begin to like, kind of explore this question of whether psilocybin could help people living with PD? Um, I mean, the answer is, as always, we try to start small. Um, this is an incremental process doing research. And of course we wanna do it as safely as possible. So, so our first step is the, our current study, um, which is a pilot study um, that we're doing at UCSF. We're currently enrolling people. We'll be enrolling people on, on a rolling basis for, for several months. Um, so this is the first psychedelic study that it's, is focused on PD and we're enrolling participants who are between the ages of 40 to 75 and at a, a relatively early disease phase for, for this initial pilot. So um, folks do have to be able to, to ambulate on their, on their own um, to be in this trial. We, the group that's conducting it, we're, we're a multidisciplinary team. Obviously this is a, a study that requires really close collaboration between those of us in psychiatry, neuroscience, neurology, psychology, um, pharmacology, and we have a team that includes all of those people 
um, that has really been instrumental in, in designing the study and, and getting it going. And, uh, and the funding comes from an anonymous donor. This is, it's not an industry supported study. Um, it is a, from the funding comes from a private individual who has a particular interest in new therapies for PD. So the well, last thing is I'll is just run through. Fascinating. Uh, are you ready for questions and answers? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to, should we pause here? Well, yeah, just to make sure That's that fine. people can get in their questions. Sure. All right. One question in the chat from Todd Morish is, has psilocybin been found? Okay, Todd, do you want to ask your question? Unmute yourself, if you would. Sure. Hi, doctor. Thanks for doing this for us. Um, I'm curious if in all of these studies that were focused, of course, on the non-motor symptoms, the depression, anxiety, et cetera, if uh, any sort of ancillary findings might have come about impacting motor symptoms negatively or yeah. positively. Yeah, thank you for thank you for bringing that up. I, that's it's one of the things that we're looking at in our study. Of course, our outcomes will include comprehensive assessments of, of all aspects of of uh, PD, so we'll be measuring mm -hmm. changes in all symptoms, but none of these previous studies have included folks with uh, any kind of movement disorder um, or neurodegeneration, and because of that, we, we don't have any data yet. We, we know that from studies in, in healthy individuals that they're, uh, they have looked at motor effects in healthy individuals, at least one study has, and did not find any um, negative effects on motor function in, in healthy individuals. We don't know. Good, still too early, but positive yeah. so far. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, somebody, uh, Lori Santo had asked about what are layman's examples for each of the mood changes that you were talking about? Um, for- That was that slide with the five, the five causes of mood changes. Oh, um, good question. Yeah, those different hypotheses. I mean, I think that the, I would say, um, hmm, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good kind of challenging question. I, I like that being pushed to kind of, you know, make sure that everything's in layman's terms. I mean, inflammation, I think, is a concept that's familiar to all of us. Inflammation is certainly a big part of, of the of you know those hypothesized mechanisms, um, so plasticity was another ones I talked about. You know, deficient plasticity. Plasticity is the the ability of of neurons to to change and grow to form new connections between one another, which can affect the circuitry uh, of our brains, can affect the function. Um, we also talked about the well the HPA axis. That that I think the best way to summarize that would just be our, you know, our kind of body's response to stress and how that also can influence um, the health of certain circuits in our brain that underlie mood. Um, I think, I think those are, that's how I would summarize. Yeah. Does that, does that help? I, it helps me. I'm okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, I was just looking at, okay, so one of them was um, an imbalance of monoamines. So right. What is that? Okay, yeah, that, 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 thank you for bringing that up. So that they had a problem, like they, or that they were, that that could be a cause of either their depression or their anxiety. So are you asking how could that be a cause? What would an, an example of an imbalance of autoamines or uh, monoamines be? Yeah, so so we know that in PD there are certainly imbalances of monoamines that are a consequence of the degeneration. So when those when those dopamine neurons die, for instance, and we have a reduction in the natural level of dopamine, that's an example of an imbalance in in monoamines. Right now we have a, a deficit of in dopamine in certain parts of the brain, which is affecting signaling within the brain. But we also know that it's not just dopamine, right, that's affected in PD. We know that serotonin circuits, serotonin is a different neurotransmitter 
but, but the serotonin is also um, changing in its balance. It's, it's decreased mm -hmm. in some parts of the brain, possibly increased in other parts of the brain. And that again is kind of affecting the flow of signals through the brain. Um, norepinephrine is a third uh, monoamine. That's another neurotransmitter. And the reason I highlight these three is because these are some that some of the you know signaling molecules in our brain that we know are related to uh, our mood regulation. We know that when we see them disrupted, that seems to correlate with these changes in mood. We don't know the exact mechanism of how that works, but it is a hypothesis about depression and anxiety. Okay, it's you. probably not the whole picture. We have Does another question here to, from one of our participants. Is there any information about the possible negative effects from using psilocybin recreationally with Parkinson's? I, that's such a great question. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. I would, I would love to, to know. I, I don't know of any, no one's done a, a formal study. I'm sure there are people in the community. I know there are people in the community who are, are using psilocybin and similar drugs on their own. Um, that's, you know, another piece of motivation for doing this study is some of our patients are telling us, well, I'm already doing this. Um, but I don't know of any studies that have asked people living with PD about their use of these drugs and about any negative, um, negative side effects or long-term consequences. I think that would be a, a great study to do. I would volunteer for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to that noted. Yeah. <laughs> now there are ways in which people can get a hold of you, right, Ellen? Yes. I can send, I mean, maybe the, maybe the easiest thing to do um, is send me is, the Rick, I can send you can the, our kind of flyer for a study that has just a page and it has our contact information on it, a little bit of information about the study. Um, and we, I can show you very quickly our team. So you'll kind of recognize recognize some faces um, when you meet people. It, it might be that, um, um, if people here have relationships with, with providers at UCSF, it might be that you recognize some of these people, but this is, this is our study team. Um, uh, so you can put faces to to a study, and I'll I'll send out the the flyer, Rick, so that people can reach out to us, um, speak with our either me or our, our study coordinators, Kim and Zach, um, to learn more about what it might be like to participate in the study. Um, and you know, we're happy to talk that through with you and answer any questions that you might have. And like I said, we're going to be you know enrolling people on an ongoing basis for the next several months. Well, great. I want to let participants know that we will be posting the video of this talk. Any slide shows that you send me, uh, Ellen, you know, we'll post as well great. as this flyer, we'll post it on our website. So there will great. be ample ways in which people can either review this video, go through the slides and find out contact information. And uh, mm -hmm. as a uh, bottom line, you can always call or email. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, by the okay. way, I did have a question that came up from one of the earlier slides. I noticed that there was a lot of use, early use of MDMA. Is that ecstasy? It is, yes. Now, I noticed that it's, some of it's been dropping off according to the chart in favor of psilocybin. You know... That's a good, it's an interesting question. I, I, I wonder if, I think it might be true that the psilocybin, the number of psilocybin studies has now eclipsed the number of MDMA studies. I think that might be true, but don't quote me on that. I'm not positive. They're pretty different drugs. Um, you know, MDMA or ecstasy is uh, technically an amphetamine. It's a pretty different pharmacologic profile. So it, it has some different applications. Um, 
it is definitely being explored for, for several different um, conditions as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Area. Well, Ellen, we're a little bit over our time here. Uh, and are there any final questions before we let Ellen go for the day? If there are, you have to unmute yourself to ask them. Yeah. Okay, well, Ellen, it's been an exceptionally fine presentation. I appreciate it. I think the participants do as well. I want to remind people that we will be posting this whole video within 48 hours. It'll be on our YouTube channel. You should get an email if you're on our mailing list. In addition, we'll post this information on our PNMD website. 